phone at work. So I'm sorry for that. Um, there might be car noise in the background. Um, uh, thank you all for attending this lecture tonight. I just have a couple quick notes about the club. We have finally received our permits for our Mount Tam star parties, the member only star parties. I will be sending out an email probably this weekend to all members talking about our new protocols for those events and about the state limits for those events and those dates. We have um, one, day, one day every month for July for the rest of the year and then also January 1st, 2022 because they do not do events on New Year's Eve. Um, so if you are a member, look for that. And if you are not a member and you have any questions about that and would like to join, feel free to email me or any of the other board members. They, it's up on Mount Tam and it's at Rock Springs parking lot. And we are only 11 miles from San Francisco yet on a clear night in the late summer, you can see the Milky Way with the naked eye. It's a magical place and it is members only. So it is very limited on who is up there. And we essentially get locked in for the night. We do have the code to get out, but we get to enjoy um, amazing dark sky within the Bay Area. And then Liz brought it up. We, as a club have started, as a board, have started talking about the eclipse in 2024. And we are, that discussion is going on on our Slack channel. And if you'd like to join that, if you're a member and you'd like to join the Slack, please email us and we can get you on there. Or if you'd like to email any of us, if you have information about it or want to participate, please let us know. And... I think that is it for notes from the board tonight and for myself. So I will turn it over to Linda to introduce the speaker and talk about our upcoming speakers. So I was also thinking about the permits that we'll need to get on Mount Tam. There'll just be a new permit sent. Uh, the for, parking permit? To put in the, oh, the, yeah, parking permit. Mm -hmm. um, that should have been sent with your renewal. And most, most of our members' renewals are coming up this month in yeah, June and our in. Web, yeah, and our website is working again. So that should all go through and it will be sent the 20, you should have the 2021 permit from last year. And if I you do. don't, you'll get the 2022 and that will still work for this year as well. Um, and having your permit is very important. And um, if you do not have your parking permit, which is issued by us, you will not be able to stay. So yeah. And if you have any questions about the permits, please email myself, uh, president at SFA underscore, no, dash astronomy.org or the treasure, which is the same email address, but treasure at the beginning. So, okay. Thank you, Linda. Okay. So just reminding everybody, we always meet on third Wednesdays and uh, July 21st, again, Zoom, same time as tonight. Fast radio bursts, electromagnetic pulses from cosmologically distant neutron stars with a 100 gigatesla magnetic field. This is by Dr. Roger Blanford, Stanford uh, University, Kai Pak, professor of particle physics and astrophysics. For over a decade, radio astronomers have been observing millisecond pulses of intense radio emissions. They now appear to be associated with strongly magnetized neutron stars called magnetars. The rapidly developing observational picture will be summarized by Dr. Blanford. Okay, San Francisco Astronomers is going to have a very special family-friendly presentation by Brian Day on August the 18th. We're so excited about this. It's titled, How Your Family Can Land on Mars and explore the solar system using NASA's TREX. First, you're going to land on Mars, you and your family, and then you're going to land on Jezero Crater, where the Perseverance is beginning its epic exploration. And you will journey across the surface to explore some exciting locations, and then we'll tour the moon. And NASA's planning missions to the moon, and we'll get to view sites on the moon where these missions are planning to, to land and work. We'll tour the moon and then we'll go to a few other worlds to see extraordinary things. You and your family will learn how to use NASA's Trex visualization portals and you'll do your own exploration at your leisure across the solar system. And you can 3D print 
your favorite feature. Imagine having Olympus Mons in the middle of your dining table. All at your home and all of it's for free. And NASA will continue to expand places to visit as the years go by. It is extraordinary and beautiful. And please tell your friends and families and kids so we'll have lots and lots of people watching this extraordinary thing that NASA has made available to us. And it will be recorded. So if you have any questions, you can go back to our archive and, and make sure that you can see it again to be sure you've got all the data you need to proceed as it will be recorded. And also tonight's presentation will be recorded also. An astronomical perspective on globular clusters. And so many of us love seeing globular clusters when we're out with our telescopes and the binary stars and planet Earth will be included in her talk. Dr. Adrian Kuhl is professor of astronomy at San Francisco State University. She's a native of New York City and received her undergraduate degree in physics at Yale. After brief stints in medical imaging and electrical engineering, she happened on astronomy and hasn't looked back. She completed her PhD at Harvard in 1994 and came to California for a postdoc at UC Berkeley. She is now at San Francisco State University where she and her students have been studying ordinary and extraordinary stars and globular clusters since 1996. Adrian Kuhl is also the director of the San Francisco State Planetarium and Observatory. In 2019, she co-founded Astronomers for Planet Earth, an organization of astronomers and astronomy educators aimed at harnessing the astronomical perspective to help combat the climate crisis. Join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Dr. Adrian Kuhl. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's lovely to see all of you. Um, I was just looking back at, at uh, my records and saw, when, when did I last speak? Uh, it's been a while. Uh, it was 2006 at the Randall Museum. So it's really nice to be, to be back and see uh, this uh, venerable uh, San Francisco Amateur Astronomer Group again, um, have a chance to, to talk with you. Um, so gosh, and you have great talks coming up. I should, I need to join. <laughs> Oh, I think you like the Brian so, Day one. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, I, um, yeah, as Linda said, I'm going to talk a bit about the research that uh, my students and I are doing at San Francisco State, and then, um, and then say a bit about um, this organization uh, that Linda mentioned, and um, yeah, and then we'll see how it goes. So, um, Without further ado, let me try to share my screen. Um, let's see. <clears throat> and I'm going to do the desktop share. And then I'm going to, and I should say, um, I'm not going to be able to see all of you while I'm doing this. Uh, it turns out we tried, tried to make it so I could. But so I'm going to say, if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and just ask me or put it in the chat. I'll try, I'll try to watch the chat as I'm, as I'm talking. If I miss it, someone else can say, hey, there's a question in the chat. I, I, I like questions <laughs> and I would be delighted to answer questions as we go along. Otherwise, of course, uh, we can talk after as well. Um, so I'm about to do a full screen and hopefully that'll work. Okay, and magically, Jay, this time I can see all of you. <laughs> so miracles occur. We were trying to make this happen earlier. In one. Okay, so an astronomical perspective on globular clusters, binary stars, and planet Earth. Um, it, Linda mentioned how enjoyable it is to look, um, you know, look at globular clusters through telescopes. I confess, really, why do I study globular clusters? In good part, because they're just really cool to look at. They're, they're just spectacular looking objects. They're also spectacularly interesting and spectacularly useful. And so that's, I wanna talk a little bit about that um, um, today, what, what, uh, what they're useful for and what's interesting. You know, one of the things that uh, I think they're really, it's really interesting about them and uh, what we're learning about them. So, so I wanna talk about what are they good for? Uh, and, then, and then the dynamics. And that's really what drives my group, you know, the work that my group is doing dynamics of globular clusters and the role in particular that binary stars play in the dynamics. Um, and then I'll end with some, uh, with, to talk about the organization that Linda just mentioned. 
Okay, so the picture behind this is a, an image of the biggest globular cluster in the galaxy, Omega Centauri. Uh, it's just below the horizon from San Francisco, but um, if you've ever been in the Southern Hemisphere, it's an easy naked eye object, and you can see it, you know, naked eye, certainly from, uh, you know, the Southern part of the States. Um, it's, it's a really nice one to look at. It's really big and really bright. Um, this is a picture, uh, a composite we took with Hubble uh, Space Telescope a few years ago. Um, okay, so, but let me start uh, just by saying, so I think probably most everyone here knows what is a globular cluster. It's a big ball of stars. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this is 47 Tuck, also in the Southern Hemisphere, also a naked eye object in the Southern Hemisphere, but it happens to be right next to the small Magellanic cloud. So it kind of gives you a perspective and scale of a globular cluster versus a, a galaxy. So you can see just the beginnings of the small Magellanic cloud in the corner there. So, um, uh, so what, are, what, are, you know, what are globular clusters good for? Well, one of the things that they did for uh, you know, us all uh, about a hundred years ago now is help figure out uh, give insight into the structure of our galaxy and where we are in the galaxy. Um, so until uh, Harlow Shapley, about 100 years ago, uh, looked at the distribution of globular clusters in our galaxy and used those to figure out its structure, uh, it was thought that we were in the center and are close to the center and that the, the, the galaxy is a relatively small place, a disk shape, but relatively small with us at the center. And that's really because there's so much dust and stuff in the plane, you can't see very far, but globular clusters are above and below the plane. They're in the so-called halo. You can see them much better, they're bright. Um, and um, uh, so it, it gets around the dust problem because there's not as much, there's not a lot of dust in the halo, negligible dust in the halo. So you just see them much, much better. And he used at that time, the discovery that Henrietta Leavitt had made that there's a relationship between the pulsation period of certain kinds of stars, so-called Cepheids, and how intrinsically bright they are. And he used that to figure out the distances to the globulars and posited that the center of the globular cluster distribution is the center of the galaxy, and it's really far away. And of course, we know that well now, but it, it's thanks to globular clusters that that was figured out. All right, so they're tracers of the galaxy. So that's cool. Uh, what else do they do? They're also, I like to think of them as really Rosetta Stones of stellar evolution. So, uh, you know, they gave us and continue to give us opportunities to study a whole bunch of stars at the same distance um, that uh, were born at roughly the same time. And that really helps us figure out how stars live and die. And in particular, um, if you make a diagram like the one uh, shown here, uh, just plotting the two kind of most basic things you can think of to measure about a star, how bright it is, that's what's on the vertical axis here, and what its color is, that's what's on the uh, horizontal axis or its surface temperature, which correlates to its color. Um, and if you do that, you discover, uh, as was discovered you know, some dec decades ago now, uh, that stars don't occupy just any old place in these diagrams. They, have, they show a very particular pattern in these so-called Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams. And it's analyzing diagrams like this that have taught us a tremendous amount about how stars live and die. Um, and so, yeah, the Rosetta Stones of stellar evolution. And I'm gonna show some diagrams like this that my students and I have made uh, looking um, at some uh, interesting star, binary stars um, in a minute. So remember the, that sort of basic idea of a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. A question. Yes, please. About the age of the stars in globular yeah. clusters. You said yeah. they're all born about the same time, but globular clusters are like 10, 12, 13 billion years old. Correct. Are, are you saying that most of the stars are that old in the globular clusters? That's exactly right. That, they are. They're born. They're all born at you know ten or you know more than ten billion years ago, 12, 13 billion years ago, um, and so that has the advantage for us of being able to then see, okay, well, twelve billion years later, you know, what's happening and where where are they in these diagrams? So yeah, they're all that old. Correct. Correct. So there was not ongoing star formation. I should say, you know, when you go back 12 billion years, 
you know, it doesn't mean they're all born, you know, the same day, of course, uh, there's some spread there. And actually, there's a lot of research right now about the details of the formation processes. It turns out they weren't born at all exactly the same time, but pretty darn close, <laughs> you know, astronomically speaking. Um, so that's where we get such well-defined diagrams like this uh, for globular clusters. So what, again, does the metaphor of Rosetta Stone piece into this? Adrian. To me, it's like a, a map, you know, it's or a chart or like a, it gives the, you know, decoding uh, our, our technique to decode. Uh, decode uh, what? Oh, how do stars live and die? And so, you know, let, let me say just a little bit more. So uh, from these diagrams, what do we know? What have we learned? And I should say that then it puts, how do we really learn this? We, over the year, over the last, you know, many decades, it's been using diagrams like this, plus theoretical modeling, uh, um, uh, just put all the physics we know into you know, models that initially were analytical and now are on computers uh, and try to, try to figure out if we can make sense of these diagrams. When okay, we, so, yeah. So what, you, what we're looking at with this diagram is this, this array of different colored stars, yeah. the same age. Yeah, and so let me say a little bit about the diagrams. That, but that's exactly right. They're all the same age. What they're doing right now depends on their starting mass. It turns out that starting mass of a star is the key thing that will determine what that star does over its lifetime. Right. And so just to say a little bit about this diagram, can you guys see my arrow if I point at different places? Okay. Yes. So along here, these are stars that are still... Um, um, in the sort of prime of their life, like the sun is, uh, converting hydrogen to helium at their centers, in their cores. Um, it's just, these are all stars that are lower mass than the sun. So, and it turns out low mass stars, they are very, very faint, which is to say they, uh, uh, they use, uh, you, they burn through their fuel or they use their fuel at a very low rate. And so even though they don't have a lot of mass, they live a really long time because they're very low luminosity, very, they use their fuel very slowly. So these stars are still on what we call the main sequence. Um, that is where stars spend most of their lifetimes, like 90% of a star's lifetime is spent on the main sequence. The stars at the very top of this diagonal pattern right here, sort of the, the, the bluest end, it's not blue, but it's the bluest end of that, are at what's called the turnoff. This is the critical time in a star's life when, uh-oh, hydrogen's running out in the center. Now what? You know, and when that happens, the core begins to collapse. The core of the star begins to collapse. And it doesn't collapse all the way to, you know, becoming a black hole or anything, but it collapses to the point where there's a funny phenomenon called degeneracy pressure that takes over and holds it up. Uh, but that core is then made of helium. When that happens, and I, I don't want to take too much time to talk about this, but when that happens, the star becomes a giant. It starts, the center collapses. It actually uh, starts fusing hydrogen to helium in a certain the edges around the edges of that core, what we call a shell, shell burning. And shell burning is actually happens at a more extreme rate than core burning. And so that causes it to become more luminous and also expand. And so then starting at that turnoff, a star begins to climb the giant branch. This is the giant branch um, all the time, adding more and more helium to the core. Eventually that helium core at the tip of the giant branch ignites, it gets hot enough to um, ignite helium and the, the uh, helium starts being converted to carbon. If you take three heliums and merge them together, you get a carbon uh, nucleus. And when stars are doing that, they jump down into this area. We call this the, the horizontal branch. It's not very horizontal. But these stars are fusing helium into carbon uh, in their cores. Um, for a low mass star, that's the end of the line. They will not go any further. They can't, they never get hot enough to, to make other elements, a little bit of oxygen uh, and things, but they don't go much further. Um, instead, they become giants once more, climb what's called the asymptotic giant branch, and then eventually uh, slough off their outer layers and become planetary nebula, which I'm sure are familiar to those, the observers here, uh, some of the most spectacular objects. 
And those planetary nebula have the core of the former star at the center, that now, now a proto-white dwarf. Um, and gradually that gas dissipates and the core is left behind and you see a white dwarf. And I'm gonna be talking about white dwarfs in just a minute. So it's worth knowing that that's white dwarfs or what every star that is um, currently running out of fuel in a globular cluster ends as a white dwarf. And more than 90% of all the stars, you know, well more than 90% of all the stars in our galaxy end as white dwarfs. It's only the very, very massive stars that end as either neutron stars or in extreme cases, black holes. So that's the sort of picture of the evolution of a, a low mass star or a sun-like a sun -like star. If the sun were in a globular cluster, it would have already burned out though, because only lives 10 billion years and globular clusters are older than that. Okay, so that's the, like I said, the sort of Rosetta Stone, all of that stuff that I just said is stuff that got learned by studying uh, 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 clusters like this, plus, you know, uh, doing theoretical modeling and, and trying to make those two things match. Okay, so what is the drive, what's the driver behind what my group is doing? It's actually the dynamics of these clusters. So it's, you have a ball of stars <laughs> and then it's typically a few hundred thousand stars held together by gravity, orbiting the galaxy in the meantime. Um, and how does that work? And you know, like, is that, is that stable? Is that gonna last forever? Or, you know, does it fall apart? Does it collapse? Does it expand? You know, what happens? And um, so it's kind, of, it's kind of a neat problem, sometimes called the, mid the million body problem, <laughs> um, although they don't all have a million stars, but some do. Um, and, um, and so I'm gonna say just a little bit about that. And, but I thought I'd start by just showing a, a, a video, if I can, here we go. This is a simulation that was done a while ago of not a million stars, but a bunch of stars, just to see what I mean, that they're all in motion, they're all responding to each other's uh, gravitational force. Um, and this is just going to show um, a simulation that um, a guy by the name of Simon Portuguese Veit, uh, uh, Zwart made uh, a few years back. And first, we're just going to zoom into the cluster. And uh, there's no motions yet. We're just, we're just kind of looking around it to kind of see the structure. You'll see the, the outer part is very diffuse. There's a, uh, the stars at the center are very concentrated together. Maybe this looks a little bit like what you've seen through your telescopes. Um, and in a minute, they're going to turn on gravity and we're going to start seeing things go. Yeah. So now things are, you know, all moving around, uh, responding to each other's um, gravitational force. Uh, stars are on all kinds of different orbits and all kinds of different orientations. It is the case that some stars escape from the cluster. Every once in a while, one will get uh, kicked up to a high enough velocity that it will have escape velocity and leave and never come back. So these clusters gradually do, do what we call evaporate, um, um, but they can last a really long time. Uh, and clearly they can because, you know, we see ones that are, you know, 12, 13 billion years old. Okay, so the understanding the dynamics is kind of the driving force behind a lot of what, uh, what I do in my group. So that said, you know, I want to say just a little bit about what do we know, broadly speaking, about the dynamics. Um, and so. Um, what, uh, what we know is that, you know, what a lot of theoretical modeling shows is that what ought to happen is that the central regions gradually collapse, the outer regions expand a little bit, um, and that the heavier objects sink to the center and the lighter objects tend to spend more time in the outskirts. So you get this sort of mass segregation. Um, and, but over time that core becomes denser and denser and denser. And it is possible that then at a certain point, enough stars will sort of glom together and uh, um, uh, you know, create a big massive star, create some black holes in various ways they can merge. Maybe you get a, um, a uh, not just stellar mass black holes like 10 solar masses, but it's po it has been suggested and hypothesized and modeled that maybe in some cases you're gonna get a so-called intermediate mass black hole, maybe a thousand solar mass black holes, something like that. Um, and there have actually been suggestions that such things live in the middle of globular clusters, but none have yet been found. There have been suggestions, but no, nothing confirmed, nothing firm. Um, so now it turns out that if binary stars are present in a globular cluster, 
they can alter uh, the dynamics very significantly. Um, and it does look like library clusters are born with typically with some population of binary stars. Um, and those binaries act like what I like to call little egg beaters in the middle of a cluster. Binaries are two stars bound together and a typical interaction between uh, a pair of stars and a passing star that happens to be you know, around in the, in the center of the cluster um, is that the passing star gets a little kick. Uh, it gets, it gets, gains a little kinetic energy, it speeds up. And where does that energy come from? It comes from the so-called binding energy of the binary. The binary will lose some binding energy, it will become a tighter binary, and then give a kick to this passing star. It's a very common interaction. And uh, the result of that is that it kind of keeps things stirred up in the middle of a cluster. It heats the cluster where you, if you're thinking of each star as like a particle of gas, right? It's like heating the cluster. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, and so we need to know about the binary star populations in globular clusters if we're gonna actually understand cluster evolution. And so we've been doing a lot of work uh, uh, trying to understand binary star populations in globular clusters uh, for this reason. And so I'm just going to give a couple examples of things we've done. And here's some of the students who've done some of this work. Uh, and by the way, San Francisco State, yeah, uh, has a master's program in, in uh, physics and a master's program in physics concentration astronomy. We've got about 70 grad students right now and about twice that number of undergraduates in the physics department. Okay, so what are these students doing? Searching for binary stars in library cluster and characterizing the binary stars. And I'm, like I said, I'm just gonna give a couple examples. So one class of these kinds of binaries that we've been looking for are called cataclysmic variables. Um, and some of you may have seen cataclysmic variables, looked at cataclysmic variables. They don't, you know, depends if you're interested in variable stars, they are, they are variable stars. Sometimes they get many magnitudes brighter uh, for just a few days than they normally are. They have cataclysmic uh, outbursts. Um, um, but there are other ways, but those happen maybe, you know, once every few months or years. Um, to, see, to see them uh, sort of more reliably, if you only are going to look once, uh, what do you do? Well, um, uh, you, you can take advantage of the fact that what is a cataclysmic variable is a is a, first of all, uh, a normal star, a low mass star, maybe half a solar mass or something, um, in orbit around a, a white dwarf, which isn't you know, really depicted here. And then as, if they're close enough together, the uh, white dwarf will, uh, material will basically spill off of the um, uh, normal star onto the white dwarf. But because it's, they're orbiting each other, there's some angular momentum there, and it can't just fall straight down onto the white dwarf. It cycles around the white dwarf for a while in a so-called accretion disk and, uh, and then lands on the white dwarf, surface of the white dwarf. Um, as it does that and, and falls onto this uh, white dwarf surface, it gets really hot. You know, why does it get really hot? Picture, you know, how hot, imagine how hot, you know, you know, an a, a uh, meteor, meteor gets when it comes through the Earth's atmosphere and hits the Earth, you know, hits the Earth. It's really hot. Well, now think a white, the acceleration on the surface of a white dwarf is about 10,000 times or 100,000 times higher than the acceleration of gravity at the surface of the Earth. Uh, and so things really speed up before they hit bottom. And so there's a lot of energy there to dissipate and, and heat up. So uh, these disks get really, really hot in the millions of degrees Kelvin. And as a result, um, they emit X-rays. Um, they're also bright in ultraviolet light. And so we're, we make use of that to try to find them. And by the way, you know, it may seem kind of, you know, how rare might these be? Well, these are made up of the two most common kinds of stars in globular clusters, normal main sequence stars, you know, hydrogen burning stars like the sun and white dwarfs, which is there are tons of white dwarfs in globular clusters because lots of stars have burned out already. So they're very, very, very common. All right, so what is this? This is, an X-ray image of a nearby globular cluster. And so it takes a little while to go, what does that mean? Well, this is just a picture that, you know, we pointed an X-ray telescope called Chandra, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, one of NASA's great observatories, um, at uh, this nearby cluster, um, and uh, essentially opened the shutter for 
mm, a couple of days <laughs> and uh, let, 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 uh, let the detector detect x-rays for us. Each of the dots here is one x-ray that hit the detector in that you know, sort of two day period. And you can see there are places when you can see there are some of those kind of all over the place. And in fact, if you point to a blank patch of sky, there's always some x-rays. And that's because um, there are a lot of very distant galaxies that are x-ray bright, and you might just get one or two x-rays from each one. It adds up to this general x-ray background, we call it. But if there's um, something in the cluster, we'll, we'll get a bunch more x-rays. You know, that's interesting. You can get a bunch more x-rays. And so each of these places, uh, there are you know, uh, tens or hundreds of x-rays were detected in one little area. And so we know, oh, there's some source of x-rays there and there, and there and there, here. And then you have to wonder, well, wait, is that something? And then you worry about that when you analyze the data, you know, how far can you go? So bottom line is there's a bunch of x-ray sources there and they're actually all clustered near the center of the cluster, which is a hint, ah, oh, they're probably associated with a cluster. So, you know, what are these things? Well, we don't know unless we go and look at optical or ultraviolet data um, like with Hubble. And so here we go. So this is um, that same patch of sky. And actually, let me just blink back and forth. It's, it's the identical pointing, uh, but uh, with Hubble. And I've just gone ahead and put triangles around the specific stars that we identified as the ones that are emitting those X-rays. And I'll show in a minute you know, why we think they are the sources of those X-rays. And by the way, it's just kind of fun to see at the middle of a globular cluster like this, it's not obvious how dense this field is because this is Hubble and the resolution is so high. It's like, ah, oh, it doesn't look that dense. But this is one light week. So stars in the middle of a globular cluster, instead of being light years apart, are light weeks apart. Okay, so a few of these things we identified, uh, this was in an early study, and we've actually since followed up and found some more, as what we think are these cataclysmic variables. Um, and how do we really know it? Well, um, not just from the picture, although I did zoom in here and you can actually see the color looks a little different than your average star. Maybe you can see that that looks a little bit blue. Here, there's also sort of a funny purplish color. The colors are a little bit of a giveaway, but it's very hard to see just from a color, you know, color image. You really want to make a measurement. And so that's what we did. Okay, so here's what the measurements look like. And now um, the left panel here is similar to the diagram I showed earlier, the Hertzsprung-Russell uh, diagram, where in this case, all of these stars, this is all main sequence, uh, that is hydrogen burning stars, and then uh, core hydrogen burning stars. This is the turnoff. Here's the giant branch. That's where there's still hydrogen burning, but it's in this shell. There's the horizontal branch, not very horizontal, but those, those are helium burning stars. But all these things are things we've identified. And like the, the brightest ones are the ones I just showed the picture of, but we found a bunch more um, that we think are these cataclysmic variables. Um, and um, this, by the way, is the white dwarf sequence, which you couldn't see in that previous diagram because it's so faint. But now with Hubble, we can see white dwarfs in globular clusters very readily. Before Hubble, no one had ever found a white dwarf in a globular cluster. They're just really faint because they're tiny and, and yeah. Uh, and, and they're not, you know, fusing, fusing, they're not powered by fusion anymore. They're just hot objects. So, um, so anyway, we found a bunch of these things. The diagram on the right, um, I'll just say really briefly, is, a, is another uh, clue. It's, it's something that allows us to um, check whether the spectrum of the star has what's called an emission line, has extra light coming from um, a, um, from hydrogen atoms in a way that's associated with accretion disks in particular. And anything here, this is the main sequence, which is vertical in the diagram like that. Anything on the left is something that's like, oh, there's extra light coming from that, from that hydrogen that's associated with these disks. So that's sort of our extra clue uh, that these are, these are these cataclysmic variables. So it's a combination of the fact that they're bluer than normal main sequence stars, um, and that they have this special H alpha emission line. H alpha is one of the uh, spectral lines from hydrogen. So that's a little bit about cataclysmic variables. We found a whole bunch of these things in a lot of a lot of clusters now, and you know many groups have have been working on this, including us, and found many many of them. They're quite common in clusters. Um, 
The, the other example I wanted to give was uh, is one that I like because it's, it involves some serendipity. So when we were looking for the cataclysmic variables, we also found some objects that we were clearly not cataclysmic variables, uh, really because when we looked at, at how they varied, we were look, the cataclysmic variables, we could see them varying with time as we, even in our Hubble observations, if we made a light curve, we could see that the cataclysmic variables, they kind of flicker. Uh, they're, they're not stable light sources. Even if they're not having a big outburst, they flicker. But then we also found these funny looking blue objects. You can see one over here. Here's one blue objects like, you know, what are those things? They look a little bit like white dwarfs, but not, not your normal white dwarfs. So we're trying to figure out what the story was. And so let me just, here's uh, just putting boxes around those three out. And these are the first three we found. So we tried for a little while to figure out what those are. And, um, and I've done some follow-up uh, studies of those as well. And um, this is the last Hertzman Russell diagram I'll show, but it's the same, same idea here, just focusing now on the white dwarf sequence. So the dark blue dots are hundreds of white dwarfs in this cluster, NGC6397. But the, those other funny things are like, they're not right on that normal white dwarf sequence. They're above it. And, and the interesting thing is it turns out that those ones above it are, they are white dwarfs, but they're made of white dwarfs that are made of helium they're, and they're lower mass than normal white dwarfs. Um, maybe about just a couple tenths of a solar mass instead of half a solar mass. So, um, so, uh, so that's really weird because we will, there really shouldn't exist uh, white dwarfs made of helium yet in the universe. Um, if, if all stars were single stars, they wouldn't exist. Uh, but uh, we think that these are another window into binaries for the following reason. We were talking before about when a, when a star climbs the giant branch, that it's got a core made of helium. Now, when a star is climbing the giant branch in that Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, if it has a binary companion that is fairly nearby, then as the giant gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it can engulf its companion. And when it does that, the companion that's been orbiting happily and not worrying about anything suddenly feels drag. There's, you know, there's an, there's an atmosphere to have to like plow through. And so that means it starts slowing down and falling in. And so the companion starts falling in uh, towards the center of the, of the red giants um, and actually heats up the giant's envelope, which causes it to become detached. And what are you left with? You're left with the companion star, whatever it was, and the core of the red giant, which is made of helium and eventually uh, becomes a helium white dwarf. Um, and so what we think is that these are actually binary star systems, and there's other, there's other lines of evidence as well, binary star systems where one component is a white dwarf made of helium, uh, and the other component is um, dark, unseen, and likely also actually to be a white dwarf. Um, and that's, you know, the details of that why have to do with where these are located in the cluster and the total mass of the binaries and things like that, that we can figure out pretty well. And so the average, ma the average mass of these things suggests that the, um, the, the, the unseen companion is, is probably a heavy white dwarf, about a solar mass uh, white dwarf. So, so here we've got you know, cataclysmic variables, white dwarf and a main sequence star, and now we're also seeing binary white dwarfs uh, in clusters as well. Um, and, so, you know, how, how do we make use of these to, to understand globular clusters? Part of the idea is they're very elaborate and um, uh, involved and, you know, powerful computer uh, simulations of globular clusters now. I'm going to show one, uh, some results of one uh, in a minute. I actually don't have my watch on me because I'm using my phone to see this. I wish I could think of it. I don't need that since I can see you guys. Let me look at this. How am I doing? 739. Okay. Um, so, so the idea is by knowing about the binary populations, we can help constrain those models. They need to know what binaries are present, uh, both at the outset and in the present day. Can there, can the models predict and, and, uh, you know, um, can the models make sense of what we see now? And so if we can say, here's what we're seeing 
of cataclysmic variables. Here's what we see by way of these binary white dwarfs. Here's what we see by way of other kinds of binaries I don't have time to go into. And can you make sense of all that? Do the models make sense of all that? So that's what I mean about providing constraints. And so that's, that, that's sort of underway, you know, this project to provide these kinds of constraints. So that's a couple examples of, of binaries that we're looking for. Um, and um, I just, I want to take a minute to say something about, um, so binary white dwarfs and globular clusters. Um, take a minute to say something about uh, an interesting connection to the the much more the the very relatively recent discoveries of binary black holes via gravitational waves. So um, I'm I'm going to guess that most, if not all, of you have heard about these discoveries, or at least that first one, which came out maybe four or five years ago now. Uh, the discovery by LIGO. Uh, that um, of you know gravitational waves coming from uh, binary black holes um, it, from the very distant uh, universe, and one of the things that I love about astronomy is how many in, kind of crazy, interesting interconnections there are between things. So I'm going to take a couple minutes just to say something about LIGO and that, and how that connects to globular clusters and the work we're doing. And and the 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 bottom line is that one of the sort of dominant uh, ideas for where how those binary black holes that are seen with LIGO, the laser and from or gravitational wave observatory, were formed was that they formed in globular clusters. And so I'll, I'll just show a, a model of that. But let me just show the uh, couple things quickly. So first discovered, yeah, five years ago now, uh, really big deal. This huge collaboration to build this incredible. I have to say this is one of the you know to my mind one of the most incredible feats of human ingenuity, <laughs> uh, you know, ever. Um, and it's a whole new window, providing an entirely new window into the universe, right? This is not, everything we know about the universe essentially is electromagnetic radiation. A little bit is, you know, particles, uh, you know, cosmic rays. And sometimes we can go places, you know, go to Mars, go to the moon, uh, send satellites out in the solar system. But to, to, to study anything outside the solar system, it's essentially all, uh, electromagnetic radiation, um, a little bit of particles, neutrinos, things like that. Um, this is entirely new, gravitational waves. So I'm going to make this quick, but uh, just to make the connection, it's, it's really cool. Um, and of course, this is what the very next year got the Nobel Prize because it's such an astonishing uh, thing to have done. Uh, so gravity waves. So gravity waves, what are they? Well, two black holes going around each other uh, distort space time like crazy and produce gravity waves. And so what does that mean? Well, literally um, uh, what it means is that space itself is altered when this wave comes by. And it's specifically, um, um, this, is, this is a picture of one of the two detectors that are part of LIGO. This is the one in Washington state. There's also one in Louisiana. Uh, the, the one in Wa they both have two arms at, at um, uh, right angles to each other. And one, wh when the gravity wave passes, one arm will get ever so slightly shorter while the other gets ever so slightly longer and vice versa. As the wave goes by, it, 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 um, the, the length of the arms oscillates, but they oscillate in opposite, with opposite phase, uh, the two arms. And that's what, they, that's what they measure. So that's kind of wild. It's a very, 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 very tiny effect. So tiny, uh, I think most people thought it like was never going to get measured, but some very ingenious people thought, no, 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 we're going to be able to do this, um, and and then succeeded. You know, after decades of work, uh, uh, succeeded in doing it. So um, so this is just showing the the detector in uh, in um, in Hanford, uh, Washington, and the one in Louisiana, um, and then each arm is about four kilometers long, and. Um, and uh, an important part of this was theoretical modeling to predict what would the wave look like? What would the gravitational wave from a pair of, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, black holes that are, uh, that are merging look like? And this is a, this is a prediction uh, of what that would look like. So they're, as they're cycling around each other and getting closer and closer, they speed up and speed up and speed up. And the waves get, so the wave, uh, the frequency of the wave increases and also get stronger until, and you know, so here you can see the, the, them going around each other faster and faster. 
get stronger and then they merge and then you don't get any more gravitational waves. And so, you know, uh, uh, that the, you know, kind of uh, remarkable thing is that that's exactly essentially what was seen. Here's the, the signature that was seen uh, at Hanford, Washington, and then the one in Livingston, and they're superimposed on each other here. But you can see exactly that kind of signature of them coming together slowly and then faster, faster, faster and, and stronger, and then poof, they disappear. And so, you know, how fast are these guys going around each other at the end? About 100 times a second. This is frequency in hertz. So right here, that's 100 cycles per second. But, but just before they merge, <laughs> they're going around each other 100 times a second. Okay, so that's really wild and kind of crazy stuff. And, but where do these black holes come from? Um, well, you know, very massive stars make black holes. Uh, but to get two in a binary is not that easy. Two in a binary means you got to have a supernova, one supernova go off and not, you know, not, uh, you know, not break up the binary. Uh, and then you got to have a second supernova go off and not break up the binary. So it's not a trivial thing to do. So here's the connection that I think is just so interesting, um, which is that when people make simulations of globular clusters, like the one I showed earlier, but with, you know, lots more details, uh, including all the binaries, um, they find that black hole binaries form quite naturally in these things. And um, that, you know, your typical globular cluster at the beginning of its life, uh, the, the very massive stars will burn out first. Those are the ones that make what, uh, black holes. You'll get mm, uh, of order 100 to 1,000 black holes in a typical globular cluster. And then the, they will um, kind of sink to the center and um, start interacting with all the other stars in there and interesting things start happening. And so I'm just gonna show uh, a couple slides that, that kind of give a scenario of an example of how, you know, what happens and ha how it happens. And this is just showing a sequence of events going on in the middle of a globular cluster of a simulation of a globular cluster. And so this particular example uh, by the, this, these authors shows two roughly 30 solar mass uh, black holes and there's a sequence of events. So the first thing it's showing, and I, I won't show all of them, I'll just sort of highlight a couple of key ones, is an interaction with a, a binary pair. So this is black hole interacts with a binary, right? They're, they're both floating around in the middle of the cluster. What happens? Well, in that case, a very common and interesting thing happens. The black hole kicks one of the stars of the binary out and it takes over the, the other companion. This is called, we call it an exchange interaction. Basically, it's, uh, it, it um, becomes the partner of one of the stars, and the other star goes off and, and uh, is, is now a single star. So suddenly, that black hole is part of a binary, even though it started out as single. So that's interesting. That, this, these are things that can happen only in globular clusters. They don't happen anywhere else. You got to have a really dense star, uh, a field of stars to have this happen. Then it shows a few more things happening, a little interaction with a passing star. Probably the binary gets a little tighter as that happens. These details don't matter so much. Uh, here's another interaction with a passing star. And in that case, oh, the passing star got the companion and now the black hole is single again. Okay, so you don't, it doesn't always win. <laughs> it doesn't always win the, the, the interaction. But a little while later, oh, it, get, it becomes part of a binary again. And then, and now, oops, and now, uh, and now uh, this, this line is just showing what's happening with the other, the other black hole. And here's where it's interesting. So the black hole, the first black hole is, is in a binary now. Then along comes the other black hole, just random because they're all floating around in the middle of the cluster. And then what happens? Well, that's, that other black hole um, kicks the, the lighter object out, the other star out. And now the two, the two black holes are in a binary. So this is a very common scenario. In these exchange interactions, it's the heavier object that usually wins the day. And so you wind up with the heaviest stars in binaries in the middle of the cluster. And so you expect to form these things in globular clusters. Um, after that, they sort of zoom in on what happens to the, this black hole pair. And what it's showing is just that it has a series of interactions with passing stars that make the, the black hole pair get closer and closer and closer together. Uh, here's just showing the separation, 2.7 AU, 1.6 AU, et cetera. And so it gets closer and closer and closer. And then, whoops, eventually 
Uh, it'll have a strong enough interaction with another star that it gets actually kicked out of the cluster <laughs> and ejected from the cluster. So this is kind of a wild story, but I think it's a really interesting one that um, you know, uh, new, new kinds of binaries are formed in globular clusters because of the very dense uh, stellar, you know, the density of stars is very unusual. And one kind of thing that can happen is that pairs of, pairs of black holes become uh, uh, binaries and then are kicked out of the cluster. And then sometime later, some person on earth <laughs> may detect that if they're smart enough to uh, make a gravitational wave detector uh, at, when, when those two black holes merge. Um, so, so that's just an interesting connection uh, of you know, binaries and clusters and, and why you know, interesting things happen with binaries and clusters. I should say that you know, in, in another decade or so, there's a plan to put um, a gravitational wave observatory in space. It's called LISA. Um, and if that happens, it will be sensitive to white dwarf binary mergers. Uh, so the binary white dwarfs we're talking about in globular clusters, for example. So, so that'll be interesting uh, you know, if and when uh, that is actually launched. Okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to say about globular clusters and binaries and kind of crazy things that happen uh, with globular clusters and binaries. And I wanted to take just a few minutes at the end here to, um, to say something about you know, planet Earth. What is it, and, and what does any of this have to do with Earth anyway? Um, and I, I think that's a question that uh, uh, a lot of uh, folks I've been discovering lately have been asking. And really, you know, why are we asking the question? Um, well, partly, you know, uh, I'll speak for myself right now. You know, I've had an incredibly kind of privileged um, career. I, 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 it happened that I was in, um, uh, in graduate school when Hubble was launched. It was like right in the middle of my graduate career. I was able to use it uh, as part of my thesis and then have, have been able to continue to use it to do this, this kind of work for the last, you know, 30 years. Um, and, um, yeah, it's been, uh, in, in, um, such a, such an interesting time to, to be able to do, uh, do work with a, a, a an instrument that's, uh, allowed us to do things that were just completely not doable, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So, so it's been a, a, a real privilege. And I, uh, at the same time, you know, um, this is happening <laughs> and I think you may all recognize this from not much, gosh, less than a year ago. Um, this is like from uh, a half a block from my house that morning of September 9th when I woke up and looked around and, you know, and it was, uh, you know, I think it obviously affected everyone. And, and of course, it's not not really news, although that was particularly um, uh, striking uh, a day, you know, uh, it's, it's, but it's not news. We know uh, these things are happening on Earth. Um, all kinds of things are happening to our climate, affecting affecting, uh, yeah, so many things on our own planet. Um, and I'll just say uh, that I have discovered over the last few years that I am not alone in thinking, wait a minute, can I really spend all my time just thinking about things that are trillions of miles away? Is that, you know, is, does that have any actual, what is the value of that? Am I just like, you know, having my head in the clouds? Well, you know, well, well, you know, uh, well, the house is on fire, shall we say. Um, so, um, so it's been on my mind and, um, and, uh, let's see, and I wanted to, whoops, and this is interesting. It won't let me go ahead. Huh. Why am I stuck? Oh, here we go. So I, I would like to spend just a couple minutes asking you guys questions, and then I'll show a couple more slides just about this organization. We can stop. Um, so let me ask you and ask people to just put in the chat, if you don't mind, any thoughts you have about this? Does it, for you personally, does learning about astronomy and observing the night sky, you know, through telescopes and whatever, um, does it affect how you see our own planet? Like, uh, what if, what, you know, and if so, how? Um, let's just share, share your thoughts if you would uh, for, for, uh, for a minute um, in, the, in the chat uh, about that. Um, and I can't look at, this is interesting. I can't seem to look at the chat. Well, um, maybe I can look at it on my phone.
I can read the- Okay, uh, now I can see it on my phone. Yeah, so, so okay. this is great. Okay. I really super appreciate uh, people, just any thoughts you have. Um, yeah, so there are all kinds of interesting comments here. Yeah, good to know where, <laughs> our place in the universe, I agree. It gives you a sense of perspective. Make, it makes, it makes uh, you realize how precious the earth is. Yeah, and the sort of how blessed we are to have so much life on one planet. I agree, that's incredible. The sense of scale, that's, a, that's such a good point. Yeah, so, so it's, you know, in thinking about exactly those kinds of things that I, 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 I've also been thinking about, and so feel free to continue to share. I have two more, two more questions, um, and then I'll share a couple slides. So, and I just also want to get a sense, on a scale of one to five, how you, how, how concerned are you about climate change? You know, how big a deal is it? How, how much attention do you feel like we need to be playing? Just, is it one, yeah, it's, you know, it's happening, but it's not that important. Five, you know, it's, it's super, super, super important. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm seeing, yeah, fives all over the place and, you know, I'm with you. Five, yeah, five, 10. <laughs> it's so important. And, and so, like I said, do I just have my head in the, you know, space? Am I, you know, or what? How do we, you know, is there some value to this? So, so the question then arises, what can astronomers do? And by astronomers, I mean all of us. I mean, professional astronomers, amateur astronomers, educators, right? There's so many classes in astronomy all over the country. I, I, I heard a statistic that a quarter million students take introductory astronomy every year in just the USA. <laughs> so that's incredible. Astronomy researchers, astronomy students, there's so many people, you know, astronomers writ large is what I'm talking about. What can we do? And, um, you know, I, I'd love for you to share thoughts that you have. I know we're nearly out of time, so I want to just show a few quick slides about what I, together with um, students at San Francisco State and now and colleagues at state and several other places. And then people all over the world, we joined with a group uh, in, in Europe as well, have been doing lately to, to leverage the astronomical perspective and, and use it to um, give that perspective uh, on earth in the hopes of, of helping um, in the climate crisis. So, and by the way, just to say one quick thing, part of it is it dawned on me, and this is partly because I teach classes and see this happening that you know, stuff in the news can be very confusing. It, it sometimes sounds like maybe there's someplace else we can go. Like there was a New York Times feature not that long ago, the woman who might find us another Earth. Well, it was about an amazing astronomer who finds exoplanets, that's fantastic. But she's not gonna, you know, it sounds, when you say it that way, it's like, well, maybe we can just go there. <laughs> well, no, we can't go there. You know, <laughs> like the fastest spacecraft we've ever built would take hundreds of thousands of years to get to the very nearest star, and there probably aren't any habitable planets around that. So, so uh, anyway, I think it can be quite confusing. So we also, I think, need to counter that narrative a little bit, as fun as it is. We also need to say, that's cool, and our imaginations can go there, and it's fantastic, let's do it, let's use our imaginations, but let's remember that we need this planet um, if we're gonna survive. And so this inspired me uh, for the science march back in 2017 to throw together this poster and say, astronomers for planet Earth. And since then, and here we were at the march with a bunch of students, I was there with a bunch of students. And uh, since then, we have started an organization called Astronomers for Planet Earth. And um, who are we? Well, we are uh, now about uh, over a thousand uh, members from 65 countries. Um, who are similarly concerned and similarly think that um, there's something that we can do as astronomers and astronomy educators and people who know astronomy and people who talk to others about astronomy. Uh, there are things that we can do to leverage those stories to say, hey, we're learning about the earth in, in the, in the, when we do this. We're learning about the preciousness of the earth and how much we need the earth and how far away the other planets are. So uh, lots of different people have joined. Um, here's our website, it's astronomersforplanet.earth. It's a .earth website. I didn't know that that existed before one of our, one of the co-founders said, hey, let's use .earth, and, and so we did. Um, uh, really quickly, right, just, you know, why astronomers? Okay, it's urgent. We have a unique perspective. We have some scientific expertise, um, and different ones of us have different kinds of expertise in different areas. And so many of us are educators and we, we interact with other people. We can use our perspective to, uh, on that interaction. 
what are our goals, provide the public with information, um, and, and provide astronomers writ large with the community um, uh, to share ideas, help amplify our voices, share ideas about how to do this, work together, and educate ourselves. Because many of us, and myself included, don't, you know, didn't start off feeling like we could talk about this. I don't know anything about it. What do I know? So we're, we're educating ourselves as well and helping each other. Some of us know more, some less. We, we, we help each other. We learn from each other. Uh, so what do we do? We've got, we've got a, hey, I heard you guys have a Slack space. We have a Slack space. We've got this website. We, uh, yeah, we uh, have, um, we've been doing make the conferences. We've got a mailing list. We've got a Slack space. If you join, you can do that. Um, we have a series, a webinar series. Uh, we've got a set of working groups where we work on different aspects of this. Check out the website if you're interested. Um, you can find out more. Um, uh, the last thing I want to say is that we're organizing a conference um, with the Astronomical Society of the Pacific um, in about five weeks. Uh, it's on July uh, 23rd, and it's all about this, um, uh, bringing the astronom uh, astronomical perspective to, uh, to this issue. Um, and we've got a lot of great speakers um, coming to that. It's a one-day symposium that's a partnership between ASP and Astronomers for Planet Earth. And uh, if you register in the next um, 10 days or so, uh, 60 bucks, um, and the whole thing's recorded. You can watch the recordings of you know, concurrent sessions if you haven't caught it all. Um, lots of really good speakers, uh, including Jill Tarter, who's gonna give a public talk the night before. Um, and yeah, it should be great. And you know, please help spread the word. We would love uh, to have the you know, astronomical community, amateur, professional, educator, you know, everyone uh, join us to, to help put our heads together. All right, and so astronomers for planet Earth, uh, hope you'll check this out, spread the word, and I'll end with this slide. This is the meeting. Thank you very much. And let me see. Thank if you, I Dr. Cool. You are welcome. Thank you for, for being here and sharing, uh, sharing your thoughts. Um, so, we... um, so Q, can we, do we have a little time for Q and A? Uh, I was about, to, I was about to ask if you have time for Q and A. Um, I certainly had, do. Uh, a... Sorry, I went a whole hour okay. here. I don't mind at all. Um, I saw two questions pop up in the chat. Um, I don't know if they're still wanting to be asked. Um, but uh, Patrick, you asked the first one and Jim, you asked the second one. Um, do you wanna go ahead with your questions? Okay, so let me find it. Patrick, you asked, do we see evidence of multiple star systems greater than two members? Oh, um, uh, a great question. There are a small number of um, cases where there are signs of that. Yes, um, there are signs of that in some cases. There are also signs in some cases of stars um, that, where, that are probably the product of the collision of three stars. Right. That is, yeah, um, in, in the middle of actually the cluster I was, I was showing, NGC 6397, the one that I was showing uh, some pictures of. So yeah, there are a small number of examples. It's not easy, right? We can't do, because we can't resolve them. So we can't see triples or quadruples like we can, you know, uh, um, when they're outside of globulars. You know, globulars are just so far away. And the nearest one is, you know, two and a half roughly kiloparsecs. And which one is that, 47? Um, uh, M4. Okay. Is the nearest. It's, it's, it's sort of in the plane though. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a bit, uh, you know, it's behind some dust. 6397 is the second closest and it's not behind as much dust. So that's part of well, why- Well, just move the scorpion aside and you'll be able to see yeah, it. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, the other question I saw came from Jim asking, is there a predisposing condition or conditions that are necessary to the formation of globular clusters? You know, that is a great question. I'll say that it really is not understood yet yeah. uh, uh, how globular clusters form. But, but what's been cool, you know, it's funny, when, when I was in grad school, the, the sort of, uh, you know, what's in every textbook is the stars were all formed at exactly the same time and they have all exactly the same chemical composition, the end. 
And now that you know, much more detailed studies have been done and Hubble really helped with this, it's been seen that actually there are variations in chemical composition and trying to understand those is helping give a window into the very early stages of, of, you know, of the formation stages of globular clusters. So I think um, that there's, there's the opportunity now to, to learn more and more about the, the, the early stages, but it's still early days of trying to sort that all out. I, I should say one other thing though, is that one thing you do see is if you look at, at um, other galaxies, when they're colliding, colliding galaxies, it's not unusual to see uh, sort of what you might call proto-globular clusters, uh, places where there's you know, big star forming regions where there's like a million stars probably forming, but they're so far away we can't see individual stars, but we can estimate the mass of this star forming region and say, wow, that looks you know, really big. So it seems like you know, collisions can do it, but you know, uh, it, that, that doesn't seem to be a necessary condition. Uh, because, you know, how would you get from collisions a halo of, you know, 150 globular clusters in our galaxy? That doesn't kind of make sense. So I think there must be other situations where you can have it happen as well, clearly. Anyone else have questions? Feel free to speak up. Well, I'll just say that I'm grateful for your talk. And tonight in the sky, in the summer sky, we have a, at least 50 globular clusters that are available to be seen with amateur telescopes. And I will, if it's clear, take my telescope out and look at these globules with a different point of view. I really appreciate what you gave me the insight of what's happening in those bunches of stars. That's lovely. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm impressed that, that you can find all 50. I've <laughs> It's uh, some of them are in very convenient places like M4, others not so much. <laughs> so good for you. Uh, but, but yeah, thanks. For, thanks for coming um, there. It's, you know, seeing how dynamic they are to me is, is quite exciting. And one of the other things that Hubble did was make it possible for us to see internal motion. So, you know, prior to Hubble, um, you could go look at a, an old photographic plate from 100 years ago and compare it to a current one or recent one and see that stars had moved in clusters had moved ever so slightly. It was incredibly difficult work. Now, in the space of just a small number of years, you can see the stars moving within globular clusters. And people are using that very, very effectively to do all kinds of really cool stuff. So they suddenly become, you know, yeah, dynamic uh, things, even observationally, which is cool. We have a question in the chat asking, uh, what can astronomers do to help combat climate change? So, uh, great question. A uh, whole bunch of, you know, come join us and, and we can put our heads together. What are, I'll mention some of the things that, you know, that the organization has been focusing on. You know, so there are kind of two, two, two areas we've been, we've been focusing on. One is to um, uh, work on the sort of astronomical institutions uh, to push our, our institutions to become sustainable um, and things like conferences, right? So one of the ways that astronomers, uh, professional astronomers spend a lot, you know, have a big carbon footprint is by going to observatories and going to conferences and now there's a lot more remote observing, so that, that certainly helps. Um, you know, we've learned a lot in the COVID era. You know, we can do more with uh, uh, online conferencing and it would save a huge amount in terms of, of carbon footprint. So we're very interested in, in looking at that and doing as much as we can. We also think it actually makes conferences much more accessible to many people who ordinarily don't have access to conferences uh, as easily. Who either can't finance it or can't leave for family you know, reasons, all kinds of things. So um, it, I think we, we think it also can make them more accessible. So that's one side, sort of the institutional uh, side, um, you know, pushing for sustain, you know, for institutions to, to have sustainable practices and meet the Paris Climate Accord, you know, the goals of the Paris Climate Accord. On the other side, and this is the piece that you know also really excites me, is that is this sense that you know um, we do have a a large voice. And I mentioned how many people take astronomy 
in, in college. Um, but then there's all right. Think of all the star parties that go on all over the you know all over the world, all over the all over the U.S. and all over the world. Think of all the planetaria. I also saw a statistic that something like 150 million people worldwide visit planetariums every year. So now, obviously, planetariums have a ton of stuff about astronomy, but astronomy also teaches us about the Earth. So let's put that piece in there. Let's let's be explicit. I think a lot of us sort of we we don't necessarily even talk about it. We, we, it, we, it, it affects us, we think about it, it does give us that perspective, but do we necessarily share that with others? I'll speak for myself, not always, you know, uh, no. I mean, I just, I'm talking about the stars. But so I, I have to actually work to um, purposefully make sure I'm explicit and include that. And so we would like to um, gather everyone's ideas and expertise and create, and we've started doing this, create um, materials that we can all, you know, make use of when we're teaching classes, doing star parties, you know, uh, doing stuff in planetaria, outreach things, all kinds of things. We can build into our astronomical stuff uh, a perspective also on the earth and the need um, to, to uh, protect the earth. Um, and yeah, so those are the, the sort of two uh, two kind of pillars uh, that we're focusing on. But it's early days, we've only been around for, you know, a year and a half or a little more. <laughs> so looking for more voices and perspectives and uh, help figure it out. What can we do? We have another question asking if the beehive cluster is a globular cluster. Ah, great question. The beehive is an open cluster. And so, um, uh, and there are a lot of really beautiful uh, open clusters to look at as well, and that's one of them. Um, the open clusters uh, tend to be younger. Uh, they tend to be in the plane of the Milky Way. Um, and open clusters are sort of constantly being formed in the Milky Way today, whereas all the globular clusters are very old. They all formed a long time ago. But the open clusters um, are continually being formed and, and there are lots of different ages. Um, and they typically have, you know, many fewer stars, but some of them are still, you know, thousand, many thousands, hundreds or even thousands or, or more stars and uh, are really beautiful as well to look at. Very good, thank you. We have another question. Um, is it fair to say that star systems in a globular cluster are unlikely to be hospitable to life? <laughs> uh, uh, great question. So there was, a, there was a nice study a few years ago, just looking for planets uh, around uh, stars actually in, in 47 Tuck, this um, lovely cluster, naked eye cluster in the Southern hemisphere uh, near the small Magellanic cloud. And, uh, and, and, and very few were very, actually they just put a limit. They didn't find any, they just put a limit and said, okay, it's, it looks like very few. Oh, um, but if there are some, maybe there are some, uh, chances are there are, hey, there are a lot of stars there. There probably are some planets. Um, yeah, it, how hospitable? Well, you know, um, it's, you know, let's see. Even though they're pretty dense places, you know, your average star doesn't have near collisions with other stars at any, uh, you know, uh, great frequency. And the, so, you know, I, I think it's, I mean, of course, life takes a long time to evolve and to, you know, sort of whatever. So, uh, you know, you're going to have billions of years without any, you know, any perilous <laughs> encounters with something else. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but, you know, I don't think it's impossible. I think in a way, the, the harder problem is that there are very few heavy elements. The globular clusters are so old, they formed before there were very many of the heavy elements present. And so um, that may be why the, the, the rate of planet formation around them seems to be quite low. Um, uh, because there just aren't, you know, there isn't the carbon and the, you know, uh, the, the, the stuff from which uh, planets uh, uh, form uh, as much of it. And so the, the, the metals. Um, and so, but if there are some planets there, and probably there are, would they survive? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to be too far away from their star um, and survive. If they're too far away, they'll get detached uh, by interaction with other stars. But if they're not too far away, yeah, you could, you could probably survive for a while. Could you survive long enough for, you know, life to evolve? Yeah, and, you know, close call. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it would be a beautiful place to be. You look up at the sky, there would be a lot of things that would be as bright or brighter than Venus. Um, many, many stars in your sky brighter than Venus. Um, so it'd be, it'd be really pretty while you were there. <laughs> Any that would be visible during the day? Um, well, you know, it's a good question. Um, I mean, you can't see Venus during the day. I, I did this calculation a while ago and I can't remember the exact details. I just remember uh, that there would be lots of Venuses. Um, would there be a few? And, and yeah, I, I would guess, you know, from the, my vague memory of my calculation, there'd be a few that would be bright enough to also see during the day. Um, but Maybe it's not, not as like, bright as the moon. And not really things as bright as the moon, unless you just happen to have something really close by. I mean, that, that statistically that could happen. But um, on average, no. Light weeks, light weeks is still far. <laughs> yeah, it just brings home, right? Just how far light years are. Uh, light weeks are also really, really, really far. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, all right. All right. Well, I really appreciate all the comments, uh, the you know comments um, from from you guys about my questions. I appreciate that. I'm always interested to hear what, um, yeah, just just what other people's thoughts are about this. And um, and I think and I see a comment from Patrick uh, here as well. Yeah, I, I think that that sort of wonderment. Um, is a piece of, of why, you know, of the value, you know, of astronomy and that wonderment, I think helps with um, kind of um, our, our perspective on earth and, and the wonder at, at what earth, you know, does um, for us, <laughs> so. Yeah. And you hear me, Adrian, it's Linda. Yes. Oh, yes, thank you so much. We will never look at a globular cluster again in the same way ever. <laughs> and uh, thank you so very much. It was extremely interesting, exciting. I loved it. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure to yeah. talk to you. I'm so pleased. Thank you so very, very much. You are very welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank nice you very much, everyone, you. for joining. Have a good evening. Yes. All right. Take care. Thank you.